What a powerful song. That's the second time I've heard that song. The first time was when he was practicing it uh, before he was getting started. Um, Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and just be ready. We're going to start with verse 21 as we look through some faithful footsteps on this, the Sunday after Christmas. As uh, Ben was talking with the kids uh, Christmas Eve, he said, what's going to be the, what are you going to do when you get up Sunday morning? Are you going to say Merry Christmas? And he's going to say, no, you're going to say he's come. He's here. Jesus has arrived. And so as a church, we put Merry Christmas behind us because Jesus, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Lord, is here. He's come, he's he's done what he was intended to do. And so what are the next steps? What do we do with the birth of Jesus? And then, of course, Easter is coming and the the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. We know all of those things have occurred. What do we as a church do now? No more parties. No more feasts. No more Christmas desserts until next year. Thank goodness. I am about deserted out. I'm about cookied out. I'm about Merry Christmas out. But I love Christmas. But it's behind. We need to look forward to our Savior, our Deliverer, And we need to recognize that He is Lord. Our passage today is going to look at three groups of people that are going to be uh, first and foremost or primary as we look through this, this passage in their faithful footsteps after the birth of Jesus. Now Jesus is going to center in all three of the, the groups of people, but the first group that we're going to look at are Mary and Joseph, and of course they, they have Jesus, and they're faithfulness and fulfilling the law and doing the things that they were obligated to do, but they, they were righteous. And so it's not just an obligation for them. They, they wanted to do these faithful footsteps. And then while they're in the temple, we see a man by the name of Simeon. And so now you have Mary and Joseph and Jesus and, a, and another person is added in there, Simeon. And, and he was faithful in his walk as well and we're going to look at that and then we're going to look at Anna who was uh, a described prophetess who was also a widow and we're going to look at her faithfulness and the faithful footsteps that she had been taking as she waited for Jesus and now with his coming what was she going to do moving forward it's interesting in the gospel of Luke if you go back to Chapter 1, verse 5, the account of the birth of Jesus doesn't begin with the proclamation of the birth of Jesus. It begins with an angel coming to Zechariah while he's in the temple. And so the birth account in Luke begins in the temple with the, with the angel coming and telling Zechariah that, that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear a son. His name would be John and he would be great and he would be a herald of the Christ that is to come. And as we look at the passage here and we go through verse 38, the narrative of the birth of Jesus closes and it moves into his life and into his ministry a little bit later on in the book of Luke. But it ends in the temple, a place of worship. And now we, his people, carry him within us and our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we worship every day as we walk through this life. And so our footsteps should be those footsteps that are faithful as we live out our life for Christ this first day after Christmas. This time when we begin to look at what is it we're supposed to do. These groups are demonstrating their faithfulness not only in following God after the birth of Jesus, but in following God, waiting for the birth of Jesus. As a church, we're now waiting, as Kyle said, we're looking forward to the advent, to the, 
to the next coming of Christ when he comes and he takes us home. But until that point in time, he has called us to be his witnesses. He's called us to be faithful. He's called us to move forward with the gospel. It's something we can get excited about. Maybe y'all have the Christmas hangover. This is something we get to do. It's not something we have to do. And when you look at these, these three groups and they demonstrate their faithfulness in following God, they're not doing them because they have to. They're doing them because they want to. Because they trust in who God is. They trust in His faithfulness and in His love for them. And in so doing, these groups confirm at least seven prophecies concerning the birth and the life of Christ that is to come. Their obedience in serving Him and their willingness to wait on Him and their desire to worship Him with their very lives are a demonstration of faith to us today. That our very lives regardless of what you do, our very lives should be spent in faithfully following after our Savior and living for Him each and every day. What do we do now that Christmas is over? We move forward with the gospel. We move forward with our witness. We move forward with telling others about Christ. Let's stand in honor of reading God's Word as we begin in verse 21 of chapter 2 of the book of Luke. Luke records this. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's anointed or the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continue to speak of him to all those who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. You may be seated. Let's look first at Mary and Joseph, okay? Here they are, the happy couple, proud parents, brand new baby. They had to have been on cloud nine, except for maybe the fact that Joseph hadn't made reservations. So there was no room at the end for them and they had to give birth in a manger and Mary said, this is not at all how I planned this, this birth to go and yet it was perfect. 
It was exactly as the Lord had predicted, not predicted, how he had proclaimed. It was exactly what it was supposed to be. And we know that Jesus lived on this earth 33 years before he went to the cross, a sinless man. But what about the time when he was a baby? What about the time when he was a young child? What about his mom and his dad? What about Mary and Joseph? The first thing you see in verse 21 is that they were obedient. They were under the law, and they were obedient to that. They knew what they had to do. They knew that they were a steward of this child that had been given to them. That had been made very clear when the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to be with child, and the angel came to Joseph and said, don't put her away. This child is going to be called the Most High. He's going to be the the Savior. He's going to be the King. And and so here they are with this, this baby... Now, now imagine, I don't know if the, the wise men had made it there yet. There's sometimes this idea that there was a two-year window. That's why when Herod wants to destroy uh, Jesus, he kills all of the children two years or younger. Because the wise men came and they told him about the prophecy. But at least the shepherds had been there. And of course, Mary and Joseph knew what they had been told by the angel and the shepherds had come and said, listen, the glory of the Lord shone around us. And we were really scared. But the angel told us, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. Today in the city of Bethlehem is born for you a Savior. They had to have come and told Mary this. And it had to have been a wonder to them that they would be the stewards of this child. And yet, let me just talk frankly. Jesus was never going to get to the temple without Mary and Joseph bringing them. The things that were required under the law, the circumcision, the the, uh, sacrifice that we're going to look at in just a second, would never have been made if Mary and Joseph had not been obedient and brought their child. I've been doing this now for 16 years, and every now and then I've gotten to talk with some families, none here so far, but talk to a family and you say how come y'all don't come to church well our children just don't want to they we let them make the choice and they just don't want to come on get a clue you're the parent and that's the tail wagging the dog parents you are stewards you are stewards of your children if you're listening online wherever you may be They are not going to make it to church unless you bring them. I'm a baby boomer. I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church every Sunday. (laughs) And a lot in my generation say, I don't want to go to church because I was drugged to church. Well, that's your choice once you become older. But I'm thankful that my mother took me every Sunday I'm grateful that she was there with me, not dropping me off, but there with me. That she took the stewardship of my life seriously. And I have no doubt if my father had lived that he would have done the same thing. Because before he passed, they were always at church. So I don't think that would have changed just because I was born. And so here they are under the law, and when the eight days had passed, under the law of Moses, you can go back to Leviticus and look it up, I don't want to bore you to death but at the eighth day a male child was to be circumcised in his flesh as a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham that he would be their God and they would be his people and they would be part of the chosen and so they, on that eighth day they went Now, they didn't go to the temple. They probably went somewhere where Mary could go, or maybe the priest came to them. Hopefully, they were not in the manger anymore. Hopefully, they'd moved into an inn. But they were someplace in that area because they didn't leave for for a good while because here in 40 days, they're going to take Jesus back to the temple. And so, a priest or a rabbi would have come and would have performed the circumcision as required by the law. And at that point, they would have named him Jesus. 
or Yeshua. What a great moment that had to have been. Maybe not for Jesus getting the circumcision, but he didn't remember it, I promise. But had they not fulfilled the law, what would have been said about Jesus when he went to the cross? In verses 22 through 23, you see that they did everything according to the law. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy or should be set apart to the Lord. Now, all of the purification rites were set out in the Levitical uh, letters, everything there about what was supposed to happen. If, If Mary had a young girl, it was 60 days before she could enter into the temple. Since she had a boy, it was 40 days. I don't know why. That's, the, that's what God gave as far as the, the instructions. And so after 40 days, she could go into the temple. And so at the end of that 40 days, when she could walk into the temple, they acted according to the law. They brought Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem because that's what they were required to do. They, they acted as stewards for Jesus and brought him so that the law was fulfilled about him. And so here they are, they present Jesus, and you see that not only were they obedient and fulfilled what was required under the law, they were now bringing him according to the law to give sacrifices as prescribed by the law so that Jesus would be able to one day be said to have been perfect under the law. In 23 and 24, you see them fulfilling this. Every first child, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And they came to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Just as it's laid out in in the Bible, in their Bible. They didn't have the New Testament yet. The letters hadn't been written. So their Bible was the Old Testament. Just as it was prescribed, they did everything that they were supposed to do. Their walk of faith, their faithful footsteps, were based on their obedience to what they knew God had prescribed for them to do. That was their faithful footsteps. And in doing that, they moved forward with the gospel, with the good news that Jesus is here. Because we're going to see when they meet Simeon, it's going to be a whole new game but as we the church today we are to be obedient in our walk it is evidence of our faith when we do what God has told us to do and you say wait a minute the law has been gone Jesus took care of that I don't I'm not going to be held accountable under the law that's true He paid the penalty for your sin, but it doesn't mean that we are released from acting faithfully. Now, these are not popular things for preachers to say, especially on the day after Christmas. The church, his burden is light and his yoke is easy. The things that he's asked us to do are not difficult. And yet, we choose day in and day out sometimes to ignore what we know God has asked us to do so that we can do what we want to do. And the irony of it is that when we do what God asks us to do, we are much happier than if we are just simply doing what we want to do regardless of God's Word. But we usually do what we want to do thinking that it's going to make us happy. Do you see the irony there? The happiest people you will ever know are those that are walking with the Lord willingly. Nobody put a sword to Mary and Joseph. They didn't have guns back then, so I have to put a sword. Nobody put a sword to Mary and Joseph and said, you need to take this child and have him circumcised. You need to go and offer the sacrifices. We know because 
It's recorded in the Gospels that Mary and Joseph were righteous. They wanted to follow what was under the law. They wanted to do this. How can we not want to give our children, whom we're stewards of, or even for ourselves, want to walk faithfully in obedience and through our obedience demonstrate our faith? Trusting that God knows better than I know and that He has a better plan than I have and that He knows what I need better than I need know and I'm going to be happier when I'm walking with Him than I am when I'm trying to fulfill my own desires. And so here's Mary and Joseph. They're being obedient in their walk of faith. Inner Simeon, they have come in to make the offerings... Here comes Simeon. And there was a man, verse 25, in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and he was devout. He was a person who wanted to follow God, who wanted to live right according to the law, but also because he wanted to please God. He wanted to do the right things. Now, we know that we still need a Savior. We know that Simeon, we know that Mary and Joseph, we know that all those still needed a Savior. But here's a man who desired to follow God, so he, he did what he could to follow after the, the laws that were set before him, and then he would do his duty, and he did it from his heart. You know, there's a, there's a scripture that Jesus, or well, there's a thing that Jesus said, it's in the Gospels, and a lot of people attribute it to giving money, but God, uh, Jesus said, listen, let a man give as he purposes in his heart, not out of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we always tie that to, to giving of your money, tithing, and all that kind of stuff. But have you ever met somebody who comes to church and goes, I don't really want to be here, but man, I'm here because this is where I'm supposed to be. Man, Come on, be cheerful. We get to be here. There are places in this, this world where this gathering would not be allowed. To be able to come together as a body of believers and to, to rejoice and to worship and to proclaim the mighty name of Jesus and to know that he's coming back for me and he's coming back for you and he calls you friend. We should want, I mean, we should, we should be dying to do what he wants us to do. You want me to forgive each other? Oh, yeah, I'll forgive that guy. If it means you're going to love me, more, I'm going to be with you, and I'm not going to be separated from you, yeah, I'll forgive. You want me to go to church? Fantastic, I'll be at church. Oh, you want me to give? How much? Oh, well, you're just asking for 10. Okay, I'll give 10, and I'll give a little bit more. You want me to bring my kids to church? It's a pleasure. And parents, by the way, my kids are grown and out of the house. Well, one's back. But anyway, <laughs> and it's a pleasure. We're, we're, we're thrilled that he's back. But I remember the fights of trying to get kids ready, and, and Saturday mor or Sunday morning, I think Satan just gets into the homes of Christians and tries to do everything he can to discourage them. You know, and so there's this, this, this mom and dad, and they're just frazzled, and they go, man, I <laughs> barely made it here. The kids just didn't want to come. But they were there. Good on you for being here. And so here he is, this righteous man. And it says that he was looking for, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. The consolation of Israel refers to the restoration of Israel. Now in that day, they probably thought the physical restoration of the kingdom, little did they understand, or maybe they didn't fully understand that it was the restoration of God's kingdom and we become part of that as we give our lives to Christ. See, the, the book of Luke is inclusive of everyone. It's just not exclusive to the Jews only, but it, it really includes Gentiles. That's one of his themes that are there. And here he is, he's waiting, he's hoping. He's a spirit-filled man waiting 
for the consolation or the redemption of Israel. Knowing that God is going to fulfill his promise. Knowing that one day he was going to get to see it. Knowing that one day it was going to happen. And until that day, he was taking these faithful footsteps, patiently going about fulfilling his duties, doing the things that God wanted him to do because he got to. Knowing that one day, God was going to fulfill all the promises that he was looking forward to. We see a little bit of that as it's revealed to him in verses 26 and 27. It says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's anointed or the Lord's Christ. Holy Spirit says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told him, Simeon, now all the others just had angels coming. Here, the Holy Spirit fills him. It says, Simeon, you're not going to die until you've seen the fulfillment of my promise. Do you see the Savior that y'all have been looking for? And he was patiently taking those footsteps of faith, patiently waiting for God to fulfill his promise, going about his life righteous, and devout, trusting and holding on and knowing that God was not going to be unfaithful. And so he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And so he comes into the temple moved by the Holy Spirit and when the parents bring the child Jesus to him to carry out the custom of the law, he was righteous it was revealed to him that he wouldn't die until he'd seen the Christ. And now it's about to happen. They brought him in to carry out the custom of the law. Verse 28, then he took him into his arms and he blessed God and he said, Now, Lord, you're releasing me. Your bondservant can depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. What a moment that had to have been in Simeon's life. To have so patiently and so devoutly continued his work in the temple, continued his work for the Lord, doing the things that God had called him to do, and then been promised by the Holy Spirit of God that he would not die until he saw the consolation or the salvation of Israel. And then this couple walks in with this child. And it says that the Spirit moved him to get into the temple at that moment to be there to receive them as they were bringing the sacrifices in to fulfill the law according to the law. To have him there at that moment. By the way, there are no coincidences. That's a, that's a God moment. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart open to it, you will see these divine appointments time and time again in your life. If you're looking for the fulfillment of God's promises in your life and you are being devout and you are living out the life that God has called you to live, you will begin to see these divine appointments over and over again and it will thrill you to no end. Here the nation of Israel under the, the boot of the, of the Romans, the promise had been made, you're not going to die until... And in walks Jesus. I get goosebumps thinking about it. What that moment must have been like. I liken it to that, that moment I said I do and I knew Sarah was mine. I liken it to that moment when you hold that child for the first time. Or that grandchild. Or you're there and you have the opportunity to pray with somebody to, to come to Christ. Or you just, you do an act of service and nobody ever knows it, but you walk out and you know, God, you were pleased with that. And you feel his pleasure. Simeon here is declaring God's faithfulness and that God had fulfilled his promise to him. Listen to what 
He says, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He was righteous. It had been revealed to him that he would not die till he saw the, the consolation of Israel, the, the Lord's salvation, and now he says, I can go. You've fulfilled your promise. You've released me. And then he declares this over Christ. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel and Jesus' father and mother. By the way, that was Mary and Joseph, just in case you're not following along in the story. We're amazed at the things that were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, by the way, just think about that. Simeon knows that this is the, the Lord's anointed. And some would say, man, he had a lot of nerve offering a blessing over them. But you forget. It says he was righteous and he was devout. He had, his whole life, tried to live out what God had called him to be. And so he offers this blessing now, there's some good and there's some bad in this. But he says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. In Isaiah, if you go back, and I'll give you the verses after this if you want, it says that Jesus will come and he'll be the glory of Israel, but many will reject him and many will fall. In Peter, they quote uh, a, a psalm that says that Christ becomes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And to many in Israel, he was. Because they did not want to believe that he was the Lord's anointed. They did not want to believe that he was the Messiah. And so here's Simeon proclaiming this once again over this child. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and he says, a sword will pierce your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may re be revealed. That points to the cross. He says, Mary, your very heart is going to be pierced. But what happens on that cross, he didn't say it, but that's what the implication, what happens on that cross will be for the hearts of many as Christ is revealed to them as the Savior. This prophecy affected you. Because if you've given your life to Jesus, you have seen Jesus revealed to you. We go on and we see in verse 36 that God's not through yet with these faithful footsteps that we get to look at. Anna in verses 36 through 38, she persevered. Mary and Joseph were obedient in their walk. Simeon, he was patient as he waited, continuing a walk of faith. Anna was persistent in her walk. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She was a prophetess. She was a truth teller. She wasn't holding the office of prophet as defined in uh, Ephesians of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. She's not holding an office of that. But a, a prophet or a prophetess was simply someone who told the truth according to God's word. And so I can give you a prophecy today. If somebody were to walk up to me and say, Jim, if... If I never accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, if I reject Him and say that He is not God, then are you going to tell me I'm not going to hell or not going to heaven? I'm going to say, yes, and not only that, but God's Word says that you're going to go to a place of eternal damnation, which we call hell. Now, that's not a very pleasant prophecy, but it's the truth, right? 
Jeremiah, the weeping pro uh, prophet, for 40 years proclaimed to the nation of Israel, you need to return. If you don't return, this is what's going to happen to you. If you don't turn back and start following God's word, this is your fate. And guess what? That was their fate because they never turned back. And so when we proclaim truth about something that could happen in the future, you're not foretelling the future. You're just saying God's word says, using that same example, that if you don't accept Christ, then your destination is eternal damnation and eternal separation from him. Now, that's something that will happen in the future but it is something that will happen. And so for some, in some way, she was a prophetess. She was a truth teller. She knew God's word. She didn't just come up with this out of the air. She knew God's word, which, by the way, should teach us something as well. We should be well-versed in God's word. She knew God's word, and she would tell the truth. So she was probably one of these people that you didn't want to talk to too much because if you were trying to get her to say something to... to uh, uh, justify the wrong actions that you're taking, she was one of these that would say, <laughs> you're not doing the right thing. You need to get back to doing the right thing. She was one of these that would step all over your toes. But she was there. She had persevered. Let's say she was married at the age of 13, which was about what was normal back then. She lived with her husband seven years, so at the age of 20, she was widowed. She lived 64 years as a widow, no children. And her life was spent working. She was not idle. She was not sitting around doing nothing. She never left the temple, verse 37, the second part. She never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. She was setting the example. Now, she probably didn't sleep in the temple because there was no place to sleep in the temple, but by working night and day, what it meant was that was where she went to serve as an act of worship. Just like I thank all the people that do all the things that make it possible for me to get up here and to preach and to proclaim God's word. There's so many people that do so many things and so many different avenues of life that make it possible for what you see. And so she was there at the temple doing the things that needed to be done praying and fasting as well, setting the example for 64 years. Now, I don't know if she ever complained, but it doesn't say that she did. But she made that her life's occupation as an act of worship to serve where God gave her an opportunity. And for a widow, there was no other place back in this day where they could really serve. She had no family. She had no children to take care of her. But she saw it as an act of worship. At that very moment, verse 38, she came up and she began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of Him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Israel. There's no specific words recorded in Luke. And, and, and we're not quite sure all that she said, but she began giving thanks to God, that's for sure. Yahweh, although they wouldn't have said Yahweh because that's the name that can't be spoken. They would have probably said Adonai. Adonai. Praise God, this is the one we've been waiting for. Adonai, this is, this is the redemption of Israel. Adonai, I've been working all these years, and I've been waiting for this, and here it is right now. Praise God. She was excited after 64 years of service. She was excited. And it says not only did she stop there, but she continued to tell people about this. I can only imagine days after Jesus and, and Mary and Joseph had left the temple. She said, I was here five days ago. And the Lord's anointed was here. I was here five days ago. And the king was here. I was here six weeks ago. And however many more years she lived. She was 84. However long she lived, she continued to worship. She persevered in her walk of faith. 
So here's the final thing that I want to leave you. Our faith, our faith is a belief in the person of Jesus Christ. Our faith is a belief that He's able to accomplish everything that He promised us, as Paul writes in Romans 4.21, that He's able to take away our sin, to give us new life, dying on that cross, taking the sins of the world on Himself, so that we might have an opportunity to live for Him and to serve Him. And so our faith doesn't end at the cross. Our faith doesn't stop when we say, yes, Jesus, and we go into the baptismal waters. Our faith is demonstrated day in and day out. Our faith is obedient to what God has called us to be and to do, to forgive, to serve, to love, to tell others and be a witness to move forward with the gospel if the gospel is going to be moved forward it's got to be through God's obedient children and so our faith to be real must be obedient how can it not be you've given your life to Jesus you call him your king and Lord and you say my life is no longer my own and by the way, that's not my words, that's Paul's words written. That our life is no longer ours because we've given it to Jesus, our King. And so our faith must be obedient. Doing the things that God has called us to do because He's called us to do it. And we want to. Our faith must be patient. Oh, that's really hard for American Christians. Because we're all about the instant gratification, aren't we? We don't want to hear about five-year plans and ten-year plans, and we don't want to take the long view, but we want it to happen right now. But God, I've been praying for, for that man to come to know Jesus for a day, and he hasn't. I'm just going to quit. I mean, that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but we do that. There are faithful parents that have prayed for years for their children and they finally come there are people that have prayed for friends for years and it finally happens our faith must be patient he's not slow about his return written in Peter he's not willing that any should perish but all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And so as we move forward with the gospel, we have to be patient in our footsteps of faith. And then finally, we need to persevere. We need to know that our faith must be perseverant. Because it doesn't happen the way we want to. We continue to do the things God has called us to do and we trust that he's pleased with us. And so as we move forward with the gospel, these faithful footsteps will carry the gospel forward in this next year. But it has to be you. Church, it has to be you carrying these, this message of good news, not because you have to, but because you want to. Not because somebody is making you, but because you can't wait to. Not because there's something in it for you, but there's life in it for those that need to hear it. Church, we are going to move forward with the gospel in this year to come. You can join us, or you can be left behind. I want to walk that faithful walk and let my footsteps show my love for him. Fathers, we close this time and we thank you for the Christmas season and all that it, that it pretends. And 
all that, that, we, that we know about it and the, and the joy of it and the celebration of it, Lord, there's a reality to it. Now that Jesus has come, now that he has been uh, revealed to the world, now that we know and we call him our Savior, Lord, we are to move forward with that. We are to continue walking in obedience to you, patiently waiting for you and persevering through the difficulties that are around us, but, but not letting those stop us because, Lord, you have loved us with a love that is beyond comprehension and you have made us your own. And so, Lord, as this church moves forward in the year to come and in the year after that and in the year until you come back and call us home, Lord, may we be faithful. May we be faithful with all that you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.